Great. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the DeFord Lecture Series. My name is Elizabeth Catlos, and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Geological Sciences at UT Austin. We're part of the Jackson School of Geosciences, and the DeFord Lecture Series is our departmental seminar series. It's been a requirement and a tradition for all graduate students since the late 1940s. The lecture series is named after Professor Ronald DeFord, who joined the university as a professor in 1948 with the purpose of enhancing the quality of the graduate program of the department. The lecture series is, is funded by a range of endowments and today's speaker is the Judd H. and Cynthia S. Walling Centennial Lecturer in Geological Sciences. The series was established in 1983 to bring exceptional and distinguished lecturers to the Jackson School for the benefit of the geosciences community. The endowments honor Mr. Judd H. Walling of Houston, Texas. He's a 1942 geology graduate of UT Austin and a former vice president and general manager of the Getty Oil Company's Southern Exploration and Production Division. He was a director and executive committee member of the Oklahoma Petroleum Council and a member of both the Western Oil and Gas Association and the Illinois Oil and Gas Association. The lectureship was established to meet the then critical need for funding outside speakers. Mr. Walling was in instrumental for securing the Getty Oil Company chair, the first company sponsored chair within the Geology Foundation, which is currently held by Dr. Mark Kluse in the Department of Geosciences. As today's talk is geothermal related, I'd also like to call your attention to UT Austin's geothermal an entrepreneurship organization, GEO, which has a mission to leverage the legacy of oil and gas research and development at UT Austin and in the state of Texas at large to enable drilling for geothermal energy anywhere in the world. Please visit their website, texasgeo.org. GEO is really considered the hub for geothermal related activities and interests at UT Austin. I'll introduce our speaker. Dr. Shevnam Duskun is the Fred Banfield Distinguished Endowed Chair and Professor at Mining Engineering at Colorado School of Mines. She's also jointly affiliated with their computer science department. She graduated with all of her degrees, masters, bachelors, and PhD from the Department of Mining Engineering at Middle East Technical University, METU in Ankara, Turkey. She did postdoctoral work at the Norwegian Geotechnical Institute and International Center for Geohazards. She returned to Turkey as a professor in METU's Department of Mining Engineering until 2010, where she made, move, made the move to the chaired position at Colorado School of Mines. Dr. Duzgun is a Alexander von Humboldt Foundation Fellow, having worked at the Geophysical Institute at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. She also had visiting positions at MIT as a NATO scholar and the University of Geneva Geophysical Institute as a researcher and the Center of Excellence International Center for Geohazards in Oslo, Norway as a research fellow. She has diverse interests in mine closure and reclamation, environmental monitoring using remote sensing and interdisciplinary topics, including artificial intelligence and big data analytics for geosciences, which she'll speak to us about today. Please welcome Dr. Shebnem Duzgun. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, this is a great honor for me um, to be um, to, to involve in this lecture series. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Um, Elizabeth, is that okay, uh, the share screen? Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. So um, in today's talk, I will um, give the basic uh, background uh, related to um, big data AI and how we use those technologies in geothermal exploration. I don't like um, giving a worthy outline. So I, I, I'm a visual person, so I will def, um, follow uh, my talk uh, with this tree structure. So in the, on the route, uh, I will provide the basics, the foundation, uh, for the trunk of the tree, I will provide our research, which is supporting our products here, as you see apples. So whenever we are underground, assume that I'm giving the basics. When we, whenever we are on the trunk, assume and consider that I am talking about our research. And for the leaves, I will talk about some products. Um, yeah, as Liz said, I have a... Um, 
great, um, um, let's say, experience over the years, the, uh, the, the use of uh, remote sensing, big data in various problems. Upon my arrival in the US, I came in 2017, um, I started um, use of big data analytics and um, research related to that in geosciences. So if you are interested in other projects, we can talk later on. Um, so let's have a look at what is this big data. It's a buzzword and I know that you, you come across um, that word several times because we're now in the uh, data age and um, even the way that we conduct science has been changing. In the past, we were um, you know, developing hypotheses, collecting data and testing our hypothesis. But there is a new paradigm coming to science. It's called data-driven science where you ex uh, extract information from the large data sets. That's why it's got big data. So I wanna give you some uh, brief characteristics of uh, geospatial big data because um, actually existing data in the world is mainly geospatial. We have the uh, location information, all the data set, but once you start looking at its location information, you obtain more, um, let's say information from the data set. So big data, is first of all voluminous. Um, in the past, we were dealing with gigabytes, um, terabytes. Now the data is reaching up to zettabytes and yottabytes. That is ex expected. And with the geospatial data types, this volume is increasing every day. The other uh, important characteristics of big data is that in the past, we were doing some batch processing. We were having data and processing it. But now uh, various operations are requiring periodic evaluation, even near real time and real time evaluation. For example, in a drilling operation, you have sensor sensors creating large number of data every minute. And if you can process that data, that data has a great value. So uh, big data in that sense is really also fast in velocity. Um, in, ge in geothermal, in this project or in this research, I won't be going into the details of velocity, but usually velocity is really, really a huge issue. The other pro problem with, or let's say, other characteristics of the big data is the variety. In the past, we were keeping all our data, data sets in structured um, forms like uh, relational databases or database management systems. But now data is becoming so large, sometimes it is semi-structured, sometimes it is unstructured, like social media, um, um, you know, uh, maps, Internet of the Things, and even every telephone call is creating a certain uh, big data. Um, however, that data also comes with large num large amount of veracity. In other words, we have uncertainty. So big data, although it offers great value, it's not easy to process because you need to also identify uncertainties and design processes to handle those uncertainties. But if those problems are kind of um, managed, big data has great value. That's why today science is going towards, um, or it's not going towards, but it is in fact branching out to support the basic science with data-driven technologies. So value comes from the new algorithms that we, we've been also handling because um, the computational power and the new methods that has been developed is helping us to develop innovative ways of visualizing it. And visualization is really powerful for extraction information. We can analyze patterns and trends with machine and statistical learning, and I'll show some examples of it. And even we can do predictions by using 
um, deep learning algorithms. And I will show how we are implementing this. And I will demonstrate how we are implementing this in uh, our geothermal exploration case. So big data, as I told you, because of its characteristics, it's not that easy um, to, to work on it. It requires, first of all, understanding what kind of value we would like to obtain from it is important. And then how are we gonna get rid of those uncertainties? How are we gonna curate this data so that our algorithms can easily process? And also how are we gonna visualize such a large amount of data is, um, is part of the processing. And once all these things are overcome, um, evaluation and interpretation of results is the last part of it. And uh, in geothermal uh, exploration context, I will show um, some of the examples of it. Um, of course, in order to have um, such a system, you need some enabling technologies, uh, heavy parallel parallelism, distributed storage, and enhanced network speed, especially for uh, real-time processing, high-performance computing, new ways of visualization, cloud computing and data analytic are some technologies that is needed. And there are newly developing infrastructure because currently existing infrastructure are not enough to handle that kind of data. I don't know if you have heard, but Hadoop ecosystem with its map reduce diagram, a paradigm, uh, spatial Hadoop, Spark, Magellan, and ArcGIS's geoanalytics server, and Google's BigQuery GIS are some examples. Um, we are using combination of them. Once um, it comes to our research, I will also mention of these. So having just describing what do we mean by big data, I'd like to give um, a brief overview of geothermal resource exploration. As you know, geothermal resources are one of the important um, renewable energy resources. However, um, investing and developing a geothermal resource um, is a bit challenging as compared to other um, renewable energy resources like solar or wind because um, if, uh, it requires huge investment for exploration and this investment comes with, with its risks. Um, and this is making uh, the development and exploration uh, processes a bit challenging. So to overcome those challenges, of course, researchers are working on developing new exploration methods. And actually our research started with this call, um, DOE's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy um, uh, developed a call. It was on machine learning for geothermal energy. And uh, this call distributed uh, only 10 funds all over the US. And one of them is our project. So we actually develop uh, machine learning methods for geothermal exploration. So I have to thank the DOE uh, for this funding because this uh, opened up um, new research areas for us. And um, that was the resource that pushed us to use some of our algorithms to be adopted and new ones uh, developed for it. Um, so we got that award almost a year ago. So um, I will uh, share with you uh, initial findings. Uh, we are supposed to finish this in uh, six months uh, and with the COVID we a bit uh, decreased the acceleration in research but I think we got some good results and I'm so happy to share some of the initial findings with you today. So our goal is to develop a deep learning model. It is basically an AI system for detecting potential geothermal exploration sites for several data sets. Multimodal data set means 
like we have modes of data in the form of images, in the form of uh, text or other uh, formats. Um, we selected, as the name implies, data-driven research requires data collection. So to develop that system, we selected three sites. Those are non-geothermal sites, but we um, decide, we designed the research in such a way that we can de develop a learning system from the known sites to predict the unknown sites. So for this purpose, we use Brady geothermal site for developing the system and testing the system in Desert Peak. That's another geothermal site. And the other, those are in Nevada. And we have another site in Salton Sea, which is in California. However, as you may um, know from various AI systems, especially in robotics or production planning, AI systems, especially the ones that are dependent on deep learning, is highly dependent on labeling the data. So labeling data means like you label uh, part of the places as the geothermal and other parts as non-geothermal. And in, for example, in, um, in uh, object detection for um, object detection AI models that are used in now various cars, for example, is based on labeling cars, pedestrians, bikes on the street so that whenever you're driving, the car recog recognize all these objects. But in geothermal case, it is not that easy. You know, we cannot have experts and ask to label all these places. So we decided to use certain machine learning algorithms for, for first labeling the site. So, and I will explain how we're doing it. So instead of asking a person who is expert in labeling the geothermal uh, pixels or sites, we develop a machine learning based system, which gives us uh, a labeled site so that we can feed that system into deep learning and deep learning takes uh, labeled um, sites like um, geothermal and non-geothermal, learns from it and then predicts whether there is a geothermal site for the given area. Um, so for this, we have three-step methodology. We have data collection and analysis, of course, developing the labeling and also training AI and also predicting that AI system for the other sites. I will go into the details of data collection and analysis and how we develop this labeling. Um, so I'm not explain, I'm not gonna explain uh, one by one, but our data collection includes surface and subsurface data. So we have some remote sensing images. We have uh, DTS measurements for subsurface data, some geologic data, and uh, we have, we obtain um, some information layers from the collected data. Those are basically mineral maps, temperature faults and deformation. I'm gonna explain what are those. Once we uh, collect and analyze this data, we um, develop patterns related to these parameters. And based on those patterns, we were able to understand where are the geothermal, per, um, geothermal sites and uh, where are the non-geothermal sites. And by using this, we created the AI. So let's have a look at data collection. Of course, before collecting the data, uh, there is a huge research behind um, this data collection. When you go to the literature, there are several indicators uh, published in the literature about the um, potential geothermal site. Once we look at the, those sites, we realize that faults certain deformation, minerals, temperature, sometimes topography and seismic models are indicators of 
geothermal sites. So we actually um, collected data uh, for these indicators. And uh, the area that we uh, are working, the, so Brady is our training site or the model development site. Desert Peak and Sultan Sea are our test sites. Those areas are quite large and uh, our spatial resolution is three by three meters. And as you see, um, we have um, uh, around 2 million, um, 2.5 and 3 million pixels. Those are really large areas and our, our training site is relatively small. And um, so the data sources, we basically wanted to um, collect data that is readily available so that we can expand that system for larger uh, continental regions. So we have, um, we use Sentinel's data sets. Those are uh, satellite images, uh, Landsat uh, surface temperature maps. Uh, for mineral markers, we use hyperspectral images. I'm gonna go into the details of it and how we do that. But uh, we also collected uh, old maps uh, in the area for these three sites. In Salton Sea, unfortunately, we are unable to collect um, or unable to uh, obtain deformation and fault maps. There is a reason, and I'll explain the, the reason later on. So what we do for fault maps is that, you know, when you go to a site, you have these fault lines uh, depicted as red lines, but in order to fit the, um, the system with these fault lines, um, we converted those fault lines into fault intensity because we needed some uh, continuous layers to be included in the uh, AI or machine learning system. As you remember, I was mentioning, you need to cur curate the data. You cannot simply use the existing data. This is an example of data creation. We realized that um, fault maps are only just lines and those are predictions, but fault intensity is a better predictor for the geothermal energy uh, or geothermal exploration potential. The other important parameter mentioned in the literature is the mineral markers because ge um, geothermal sites usually gone through hydrothermal alterations. So what we did is that we collected hyperspectral images. Those are basically um, really large um, data sets, a large number of spectral bands. And, um, and we also have the mineral signatures because from the literature, we know which minerals are indicative of um, geothermal alteration or hydrothermal alteration. So we need we needed the mineral signatures. So by looking at the mineral signatures and by looking at the, um, the pixels, we identify whether the mineral of our concern exists in that pixel or not. Of course, this is not an easy task. There are several problems. I can explain the problems if we have time, but because of the difficulty of this task, there are several algorithms developed in the literature. And we realized that not a single algorithm will serve our purpose. Uh, so what we did to overcome this problem is that we use all these algorithms. We created, so the, um, the uh, acronyms in each map is showing the method. So each method is providing us uh, a mineral map. By the way, the orange areas are built up and the gray areas are road. Those are human-made structures. That's why we didn't count them in our analysis. So those are uh, gypsum, kaolinite, opal, and in some parts, a hematite are the minerals that are of concern to us. Um, so these are some maps created from each algorithm. As you see, each algorithm is kind of giving some part of the opal, for example, look at this opal map. Those are yellow areas here. And these yellow areas are more or less the same in this map. 
but it is quite larger in this map. So because of the uncertainty that is created by all these algorithms, what we did is that we obtain all these products and then we create a majority or highly confident mineral maps. We combine all these algorithms based on their product. For example, if uh, three of the algorithms are showing that pixel as opal or uh, chalcedony, for example, we uh, give a highest probability of mineral existence for that pixel. So once we create all these, the next thing is to look at um, the temperature, because we know that surface temperature uh, is a good indicator of um, mineral uh, or existence of geothermal. Um, but if you collect uh, land surface temperature maps from readily available Landsat products, you will see a really large distribution of temperature. Uh, because it's seasonal, it is dependent on land use, land cover. What we are interested in persistently hot zones, those are actually anomalies. So we need to obtain or we need to develop an algorithm in such a way that it will give us persistently um, hot areas. Uh, so what we did is that we downloaded a really large um, land surface temperature data set, uh, almost two years data set. And uh, then we look at uh, the certain temperature characteristics. This is called statistical thresholding. We look at uh, the distribution of temperature in each image and we identify the range of temperature distribution and then see uh, persistently um, appearing ra ranges. Once we obtain this, uh, we use k-means clustering algorithm. It is one of the well-known machine learning algorithm. And based on those clusters, we realize that persistently hot zones are appearing in certain clusters. So we use those patterns as the indicators of geothermal. And this is an example of thresholding. And here you see an image set that we obtain. And as you see, depending on the time of the year, depending on the season, temperature in its original form doesn't show anything. But if you, look, if you use machine learning algorithms and if you cluster them, you actually see some clusters. Uh, remember I told you that we use land, um, some geophysical data, there were temperature measurements in that area and, and also the well, um, data that is coming from the geothermal production in this area. Jemna, we, just we, inter inter interrupt real quick. The, the figures were a bit sure. truncated um, in the last slide. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, I don't know if we can fix it, but we can see this one fine. So I guess we could keep going. But This one? Yeah, this one this is one fine. Was, OK, how about this one? Yeah, this one looks good. Yeah. OK, OK. Um, so just let me know, I may go back and maybe it's coming uh, because of the latency, uh, because of the internet speed, the resolution is probably decreasing initially. Um, so this, this map is showing the persistently hot zones and we were able to validate this hot, these hot zones by the geophysical measurements because in that area there were wells and also geophysical DTS measurements. Um, to, to uh, validate our findings. Uh, the next um, information that we would like to use is the deformation because when you have geothermal production uh, in the area, there are areas subsiding and some areas are uplifting. Of course, you may think that, how are we gonna use that information for exploration? Because if there is no geothermal production, um, how we will see that deformation. Yes, you're right. But if you train your network with the deformation, even though you don't have information, the, the network, the deep learning network still keeps that information and you can still use it. Second is that we would like to see 
if we are able to delineate geothermal zones by looking at the deformation so that we can use this as the second um, validating parameter. So for this one, we use um, SAR, um, you know, interferometric SAR analysis. This is a really complicated process. I have one dedicated researcher who is only doing that kind of work. Uh, and then we obtain a really huge set of deformation. As you see, deformation is also a time dependent parameter. So we have almost three years of deformation for the site. But of course, we, we need to understand the pattern of deformation. We're not interested in absolute deformation. We're interested in where are the subsidence, where are the outbreak zones. And with that um, purpose, we use uh, another machine learning algorithm because this is a multivariate um, unsupervised learning method. Um, it's called, sorry, it's called self-organizing map. Self-organizing map finds self-organization in the data by using a neural network approach. And once we use these self-organization, we obtain these curves. These curves are showing us uh, certain deformation patterns or velocity patterns that is appearing in the site. So, for example, these uh, declining lines are showing subsidence and these, um, let's say, um, uh, in increasing lines are showing uplift. So once we map these trends into this uh, region, we actually figure out where are the uh, areas that are uplifting, where are the areas are subsiding. Once we combine all these, sorry, um, we have this the formation characteristics. Actually, when you, when you look at this zone here, uh, I mean, the, when you combine blue and red uh, areas, that is showing a kind of a boundary. That boundary is also showing the uh, impact area of the geothermal production. But on the other side, it is also a, an indication of the geothermal deposit. And blues are showing the uplift and um, reds are showing the subsidence. Once we um, finish all these uh, analysis, the next step is to, uh, is to label. As you uh, remember, it is not easy to label, for example, this pixel as non-geothermal and this pixel as geothermal. And without having that information, none of the AI, existing AI algorithms will work because the existing algorithms are basically called supervised learning algorithms. In supervised learning algorithms, you need to feed the system with um, and some non-geothermal pixels and non-geothermal pixels. So for this, we obtain, as you remember, we obtain patterns for minerals, patterns for temperature, patterns for fault and deformation. So we, since this is again, a multivariate data, we use again, self-organizing map algorithm. This is a unsupervised machine learning algorithm. And we keep the spatial resolution the same, like three by three meters. And then we select the best candidates labels for geothermal. And the rest uh, are the non-geothermal pixel. So this is an example of the Brady site. So yellow areas are showing the uh, geothermal sites. The, the white areas are human-made structures and the, um, the black areas are non-geothermal. So this is just one section of it. Actually, area is much more bigger than that. So once we label this, we need to establish this deep learning model or AI model. Um, most of the deep learning models are basically developed for object detection. And also, if you go to, for example, TensorFlow or PyTorch, those are the libraries for AI modeling or Google image map. You will, find, you will see large number of images 
images that are developed for training. Usually those images are either um, color images with RGB bands or black and white. In our case, we don't have RGB images, first of all. Second, um, we have more than three uh, image layers, like it's not RGB, but we have really large layers like minerals, folds, uh, temperatures, displacement, and we are planning to add more layers once the information is available. So for this, we develop our own inception learning model. Uh, if you want, I can give you the details of the inception model, but this model takes uh, image patches that we labeled here. And in order to create a universal learning, we um, rotate those images several times uh, to feed the system so that system can understand every combination of pixels. And to do that, of course, the question is how large we should have those image pixels. So this is basically a trial and error um, process. And um, we find several uh, patches useful. And of course, if you make the patches really small, you will have large number of data and this requires large number of processing. So what we did is that we tried several, um, uh, let's say, set of large size patches and small size patches and try to optimize the best patch combination. And each time we create the patch, we need to also rotate them in um, 10 to 15 different directions. So we have a huge data set uh, to be trained by that system. Here are some examples of it. So for the Brady site, we selected 6.8% uh, of the images. So these are the yellow areas that are selected. And, um, and then we, th those are around 40K pixels. And um, then we select part of the pi labeled pixel as validation because we don't want um, to use all these pixels for training because we want the system's performance. So we need for testing uh, the system's performance. So those validation data is actually testing the performance. And we have another set of data that is totally different from those labeling where we keep this for absolute accuracy testing. Um, so for Brady, we have around uh, 600,000 pixels. And for Desert Peak, we have 2.5 million pixels. Uh, we haven't done um, the Salton Sea um, I, and I will explain why we haven't done, but we are working on this um, so that I will show the results for, um, for these uh, two sites. And we are also applying a transfer learning approach. So transfer learning is that you are training your network in one side and then using that network for another side without having any training data set from that side. So we wanted to test how a train network working in Desert Peak will um, perform, uh, sorry, how a train network for Brady will perform in Desert Peak without having any data, training data from Desert Peak. So here are the results. So as you see, uh, when we train uh, Brady and test it, our accuracy is really good. It's almost 99%. It's the same with the desert peak. So, but that's not what we would like to have it because we cannot have all the time those sites are labeled and then make a prediction of the geothermal deposit. So what we did is that we used the train network and to test this in Desert Peak and we reach up the accuracies of 80%, which is not that bad. And 
we have, you, you see here uh, in parentheses, 5L and 3L. 5L re um, represents three uh, layer, sorry, five layer data sets. Five layer data set is including deformation and three layer data set is excluding the deformation. So even though we don't have the formation information for Desert Peak, we can still reach up to a certain amount of accuracy. Um, so for our research purposes, we are still working on improving uh, the accuracy. Those are initial results. Um, there are several ways of inc increasing the accuracy. So if you are interested later on, I can also talk about these. So before, I'd like to give more time for you to discuss, um, and I'd like to answer your questions and listen your comments. But before uh, finishing my talk, um, I'd like to thank to all my team, um, because without this team, I won't be able to deliver all these results. Um, uh, Dr. Du is from Geophysics. This is highly an international, uh, sorry, interdisciplinary and international team. Dr. Chower and Soydan um, is, uh, has great expertise in mineral, ex uh, mineral mapping and displacement ma uh, mapping. Uh, Jim Moraga is our PhD student. He is an excellent computer scientist and computer engineer. And he, he, and in fact, this, the inception uh, network is his architecture. That's an original architecture. And he developed the architecture for just geoscience problems. We actually use that algorithm for other purposes. And Dr. Saleh um, is helping us for commercialization and um, marketing the product. He is the, um, Associate Director of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center. So he is kind of looking at our findings in terms of uh, scalability and marketing. Uh, we have several ideas for this. Um, and the, 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 the future steps will include uh, at least training the networks with some other sites because most of the data sets that we are using are open data sets, easily available. And if you have temperature, land surface temperature, if you have fault intensity, if you have um, displacement, even you, you, you may not need displacement, but if you have mineral maps for a given region, it's still possible to make a prediction. Remember I was telling you that uh, we haven't done all the analysis for Salton Sea. The, re the main reason is that Salton Sea is a really huge area and we have only a very small area for the data collection. Second is that the land use in Salton Sea is quite a um, mix, mixture of uh, water and some agricultural areas. So when you have the agricultural area mapping minerals is almost not possible and also obtaining um, displacements is not possible. But still we are taking the challenge and we would like to see what is the lower bound of our prediction. So we are working on this just to see the worst case scenario. And we are looking for other sites to enhance the learning process and also um, test the network and test, the, test our research results for um, predicting the unknown sites. So that, is, that ends my presentation. I would like to um, provide you the brief overview of how we are handling the, um, the, the, the problem of uh, prediction with uh, big geospatial data. Here, we don't have uh, velocity, for example, all the data sets are coming, but uh, are readily available. But if we have, for example, well data uh, with some sensors, this is definitely a very 
um, useful information to enhance our knowledge of learning. Uh, so this is definitely open to further research. So I, I would like to uh, have your views and now uh, your questions um, on the subject. And I'm really happy to, to be with you here. I really want to say thank you, Dr. Duskin, for the talk. And thank you, everyone, for attending. And I'm going to end the session here. I know that we're going to go to Rowan Martindale's happy hour session after this. For those of you who know that link, we're welcome to, to talk to Dr. Duskin some more there. Yeah, I, I thank you to everyone for listening to talk. And if you have further questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. Unfortunately, I was unable to reply or uh, probably the messages, but um, I'm happy to be in contact with you. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Liz, by the way. Thank you also, bye-bye.